evening with you all. Um, I'd like to thank the chairperson, um, the speakers, and also the panel today for being here and putting this together. Incredibly excited to uh, able to share a little bit about Paxman and why we do what we do, uh, but more importantly, hearing from Dr. Bajpai and Dr. Vora uh, today and about their experiences in India. So India is an incredibly um, important market to us and we're excited to do more. And hopefully in the coming, uh, coming months, uh, we'll have more opportunity to work with you all. So let me get started then. So why is scalp cooling so important? So really it is one of the most feared side effects for patients um, undergoing chemotherapy treatment. In fact, about 75% of patients rank it one of the most feared side effects. It's often considered one of the most traumatic side effects of the treatment and can even lead to social isolation. And it doesn't just affect the patient, it actually affects the patient's friends, family, work colleagues. In some patients, it will affect self-image more than breast surgery. And then there are a number of patients who will actually reject chemotherapy because of that. We also see um, in a number of patients who have a high or acute high dose or a cumulative dose of over 400 milligrams per meter squared, a persistent level of alopecia. And that's in about 10% of patients. This toxicity can be stopped with scalp cooling. So why we do what we do specifically at Paxman? So this all started in the 90s when actually my mum uh, my late mum was diagnosed with breast cancer in the 90s. She had late stage cancer. She was only young and she had four young children. And my mum didn't want to lose her hair. She didn't want to look like that cancer patient. So they actually offered my mum something called scalp cooling or cold caps all those years ago. But unfortunately, it was unsuccessful for my mum. That was the first time she was really affected by her disease and her poor prognosis. So seeing that distress that it had on all of us, not just my mum, my father started to look at, well, why didn't it work? And what can we do to help patients in the future? So we've spent the last 20 years developing scalp cooling technology, but more importantly, making sure it's accessible globally for patients to have that choice, to make that decision about scalp cooling. We lost my mum 20 years ago, so we're very passionate about why we do this. So where are we in the world? As I said, we've been doing it for some time now. Um, so India, we've been working in that market for a number of years. In fact, we were just saying that uh, Dr. Vora and I met about three and a bit years ago. But we manufacture everything in the United Kingdom, which is where we're based. And it's a British manufactured good. We've got about three and a half thousand of these scalp coolers worldwide now. Um, if you visit us in England, and I'm sure many of you may have trained in the UK or at least had some working experience in the UK. We're in 97% of all the National Health Service hospitals and the private sector. So all the big names, the Clatterbridge, the Christie, all on Harley Street, the big private groups also all offer scalp cooling with our device. We've also started distributing internationally for the last 10 years and we're in about 50 markets worldwide in some of the best cancer centers known. So really starting to become a standard of care in many countries. In terms of the US, which is probably our highest growth market, we've got 330 locations alone in this market since we got FDA approval three years ago. So really moving towards standard of care, which is incredibly important. And um, some of the names that you'll know in, in the US are the likes of Dana-Farber, Mayo, Mass General, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Fred Hutch at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, MD Anderson. In fact, I think we're in the top 11 cancer centers in the United States, along with many others. So a little bit about the system. So our scalp coolers come in a single model or a double model, and I'll show you a picture of the double model shortly. And what we do is we pump a liquid coolant around a soft silicon um, cooling cap that's worn for the patient 30 minutes before the chemotherapy, so during antiemetics, throughout the chemotherapy treatment, and then normally about 90 minutes to two hours after treatment. So minimal nursing supervision is needed in that last 90 minutes, and the patient finds it generally well comfortable, um, can disconnect, go to the bathroom, etc. They can read a book. Many of our patients also will just fall asleep. The coldest part is that first 10 to 15 minutes when the cooler is first switched on. 
It's very, very simple to use. And we've designed that with the nurse in mind. What we want to try and ensure is that it is easy to use and it minimizes the impact on your infusion centers as much as possible. So we have a PSCS1, which treats one patient at once, and a PSCS2, which you can see here, which can treat two patients at once. So you can have a patient sat by the other patient and treat them simultaneously. So much easier for a larger or busy clinic. So how does scalp cooling work? So it's the only method that we can use to actually reduce or prevent chemotherapy-induced alopecia. So chemotherapy works, as you all know more than I do, damaging the mitotic and metabolic processes in cancer cells. So what we do is we cool to protect. By cooling to around 18 degrees Celsius, we induce vasoconstriction. So we restrict the blood flow and the amount of chemotherapy that gets to the hair cells. Very, very simple. What we also see is that these lower temperatures is a drop in metabolic rates. So this drop in metabolic rate reduces cell division, therefore less targeted effects of the chemotherapy. More recently, we've developed our own in vitro cell culture methods, where we actually infuse different chemotherapies into the hair cells or the skin cells, and then look at those cells at different temperatures to check cell viability. What we have seen is that less drug diffuses through the cell membrane at lower temperatures, both actively and passively. So the more we learn about these types of uh, mechanisms, the better we can make scalp cooling in the future. So there's lots of clinical data available. And as you know, one fantastic clinical paper, which I'll touch on very briefly uh, by Dr. Bash Pai at the Tartar Memorial Hospital. But we've got now well over 8,000 study subjects within all our data globally. So different ethnicities, uh, different hair types, etc. What we tend to see is most are designed in a, in a sort of observational way with either historical controls or even uh, smaller control groups. But we do have a couple of randomized control trials um, and then some other smaller registries. The largest registry we have has got around 7,000 subjects in it. What we tend to see on average is that 50% of our patients are successful, or 50 to 60% of our patients are successful, should I say, across a wide range of chemotherapy types, but also solid tumor types. Whereas we don't see patients who don't have scalp cooling be successful. So a very, very good benefit. Here we have a randomized control trial. This is the trial we actually got our FDA clearance from. And this was um, put together with the Baylor College of Medicine, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, US Oncology Research and Cleveland Clinic, all very key centers in the US. What we saw at the end was that the primary interim analysis, sorry, is that 50.5% of our patients were successful versus no patients in the control arm. A clear superiority, which actually led us to submit to the FDA. We continued that study to 180 patients and what we saw after the 180 patients was that 53.1% of patients were successful versus no patients in the control arm. Again, very, very clear benefit of scalp cooling. What was interesting, though, is that the anthracyclines versus taxanes was different, as we've learned already, but only 16% of patients initially were successful with anthracyclines. But after time, that rose to 24%. So what we've taken away from that study is that there's always a learning curve. So I'm sure Dr. Bajpai and Dr. Vora felt initially that actually their results got better over time when the nursing teams got more comfortable with the use of the device. And that's really important why we invest in training and really encourage to educate the patients properly too. Um, scalp metastases has historically been a concern. This is the, a study which is looking at scalp metastases with a five-year follow-up. But of course, we've not seen any concerns as yet. And most patients rated this reasonably comfortable. In terms of side effects from this study, we see headache and nausea as the most prevalent. However, always grades one or two and always um, transient. So easily managed with polite pain relief or even Ativan in certain cases, and it always disappears. We do see some sinus pain, protists, dry skin, et cetera, jaw pain. And we've seen some light um, skin damage when a headband or a protector has not been used, which we always recommend in our IFU. This is a German study. I think it's got to be that German efficiency that's coming out to some extent. So what they did is they actually reviewed this data compared to our US data 
and said that the nurses were well experienced already and well trained with the device, which helped. They understood how important cap fitting was and also that they followed hair care measures. So very key to understand this. They use anthracyclines and texanes, but in Europe, we use epirubicin over adriamycin. Just looking at the actual overall results, about 20% of patients didn't have really any hair loss and 32% of patients had about less than 30% hair loss. So some really strong evidence here. This is a Dutch study and I really bring this to light because they've got over 7,000 patients in it now. And on average, we see that 56% of patients are successful across a wide range of drug types, as you can see in the table below. What's important to understand is that we do see variations from location to location. And I really do think that is about how well it's used. And again, that's really important that we really push for training in our, in our hospitals, in our centres. Um, one important thing to think here as well is it's across a, a wide range of solid tumour cancers. A Japanese study, I'm not going to go into masses of detail on this, but this is one of the first studies, although Dr. Bajpai has also proven this, which is wonderful, is that we see when patients have scalp cooling, even when they're not successful, they get much stronger and faster regrowth. A really important discussion to have with your patients. If you look at the images here, two of the top patients have had scalp cooling and the control arm do not have scalp cooling. You look at eight, four weeks and eight weeks and 12 weeks after chemotherapy, the rate of regrowth is incredibly strong. What was interesting in this particular study is that the efficacy overall was relatively low at about 30%, but we believe that 30% may well be related to um, the head shape of the Japanese. So in Japan, what we've done is develop a slightly different cap which we are now also using in India, which we believe is a better uh, fitting cap for different populations and ethnicities. And we'll continue to work on the cap to make it even better in the future. Another Japanese study, which really shows when we do use the product correctly, unlike the previous Japanese study, we get much better efficacy, more in line with our um, results in Europe and the results we've seen in India. What's interesting here, though, and I bring it to your attention, is that they get better results with anthracyclines than taxanes, which is different than what we see, um, in, again, in America and in Europe. More work needs to be done there to see if that's anything to do with ethnicity or race, um, but we will understand in the future um, what that might mean. It may be just this particular study. And then very, very briefly, because I believe Dr. Bajpai will be talking about this particular study, but this was a fantastic randomized control trial looking at scalp, cool at the, scalp cooling at the Tata Memorial Hospital. And what we saw again is on average around 56% of patients or 55% of patients uh, were successful with scalp cooling. And that's with anthracyclines and taxanes. What's interesting is we, tend, we saw that if we provided the taxane first, followed by the anthracycline, we got far superior results which has also seen, been seen anecdotally, but this was the first study to prove it, which was fantastic. And where we can use the taxane before the anthracycline, we should really consider that in the right setting. What we've also seen, um, again, is that faster and quicker regrowth, which is excellent. I touched on this earlier, but persistent alopecia. So patients who have a cumulative dose of 400 milligrams per meter squared have seen around 10% persistent alopecia. So that's grade two alopecia for over 12 months, uh, which is very concerning for patients. What we see if we scalp cool, we don't see any persistent chemotherapy induced alopecia. Scalp metastases has been long debated by many around the world, but what we do see from the retrospective analysis that has been carried out in, in large meter analyses that actually no patients um, with or without scalp cooling see a heightened or an increased level of um, increased level, sorry, of um, scalp metastases as a primary occurrence and ultimately overall survival. In the United States, it's now NCCN recommended 
as a category 2A option for patients with invasive breast cancer, ovarian cancer, fallopian, fallopian tube cancer, and peritoneal cancer. So I think a really important step towards standard of care. We also know that very soon, the scalp cooling will also be included on the Australian um, breast cancer guidelines and other cancer, on other solid tumour guidelines too. And we'll continue to work with global guidelines to make sure this is standard of practice. Patient support is really important and I think we need to probably do more in India and we will support our brilliant partner access devices in doing this, but really making sure that patient has the right support. We've just launched our coldcap.com new website, which is specifically for the patient. It has a great decision tool on there, which is being developed using the data from the Dutch study, the Dutch registry with over 7,000 patients in it. And that actually allows the patient to go online, put in their drug regimen, and understand what levels of efficacy they get. So they can make a really informed decision on whether scalp cool is right for them or not. We also allow us to put where we are in the world, whether or not scalp cooling is offered at your particular institute. So a good marketing tool as well. We have a hair care website, which is fantastic. Again, hair care is really important for good efficacy. So we really urge your patients to go and look at our materials. What we're wanting to make sure as well is that we're more inclusive and more diverse in the people that are on our websites. So it's appealing to all ethnicities around the world, which again is really important, especially when we're talking about hair types, etc., and European versus Asian hair, etc. And again, more patient education, more patient leaflets. Hopefully we can work with you all to develop the right materials going forward, which will be in your hospitals. I personally am very committed to research and what I want to get to a place is that it's not 50 to 60% of patients that are successful with our device, but it's 100% success. Now we may never get there, but that's my real sort of goal and ambition. What we're working on at our Paxman Research and Innovation Centre is the future of scalp cooling. So that will include the perfect fitting cap. So we're looking at 3D printing and 3D personalization to make that perfect hat and especially out of sustainable materials going forward as well. What we're also developing in addition to that is something topical to use with scalp cooling. And that topical product will allow us to really reduce the impact of um, hair loss. I'm just going to check the chat function. So what I want to say is just a big thank you to uh, Dr. Bashpai and Dr. Vora, um, not only for today, um, but most importantly for the work that they are doing in India and the help they are giving Paxman and Access in terms of really starting to make scalp cool um, be available for patients. And that's a huge support and we really do appreciate everything you've done and the, the best practice you're sharing with your fellows um, around different parts of India. So from myself and, and also from Access Devices and all my team, yeah, we can't thank you enough for, for what you're doing. And finally, just to say a big thank you to all the, all the speakers today, the panel, the chairperson, Access Devices for putting this on, and then everyone who's attended. So I look forward to uh, in the next 12 months, hopefully getting out to India when I can travel again and coming and spending some time with you all. Um, but thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the um, presentation.